رحم الله من قرأ سورة الفاتحة أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الذي قصرت أن رؤيته أبصار الناظرين وعجزت عن نعته أوهام الفاسفين الحمد لله رب العالمين الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين خاتم النبيين أبي القاسم محمد وأهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين الماسومين الذين ذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا أما بعد فقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى وقوله الحق وهو استق القائلين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الذين يبلغون رسالات الله ويخشونه ولا يخشون عهدا إلا الله وكفى بالله حسيبا صدق الله العلي العظيم Dear brothers and sisters in Iman, Salaamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuhu. The verse that I recited for the second night in a row is from Surah Ahzab, ayat number 39. The discussion under the topic of deen and our responsibilities has reached in its fourth step. And I'd like to first and foremost, extend my apology for the feedbacks and constructive feedback that I've been receiving, and I'm trying to make sure that I can apply them every time I get an opportunity. And uh, it's good to know that people are listening and paying attention to the topic on hand. And then as tonight's discussion, we're going to be covering the fourth stage as far as our duties toward this deen are concerned. Now, of course, there are many other aspects of deen and the wadaif and the duties that are concerned. But we chose these five that we plan on discussing in this Ashra of Muharram al-Haram. After having mentioned, and just a reminder, the first and foremost duty was to be able to recognize and have the proper marifat of this deen. Second, our duty was to be able to show complete submission toward this deen. Third, our duty and a collective duty was to be able to spread this deen. And tonight, Fourth duty is to be able to defend this deen. And of course, when you look at the creation of insan, or creation of any human, any creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in general, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has equipped all of his creations with some sort of defensive mechanism. There is some defensive mechanism that exists in all of the creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To some, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given a venom to defend themselves against danger. To some, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given the ability to camouflage in danger. 
To some Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given sharp teeth, talons, and other means, smell and whatnot, so that at times of danger, they're able to defend themselves. While the venom of a snake is fatal to you and I, this venom serves as a, serves as a, a defensive mechanism for him. I'm sure there are a lot of people still on the other side of the hall, if uh, they can hear me and if they intend on coming to the main hall. Uh, inshallah, this will be the time with a loud nara salawat. Oh. One more loud nara salawat. And third, for the lo loudest of your voices, for the love of Imam Zamana, Ajalallahu Ta'ala Farajahu Sharif. And if you can hear me out there, you can stay there as well if you want to. So, Allah has given us all these defensive mechanisms. Now, of course, when it comes to animals, they're limited in their supplies, they're limited in their abilities. But when it comes to human beings, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us what is called aql. And with this aql, you and I are able to defend ourselves from a variety of dangers that pose us, pose in front of us. Whether it be the weather, whether it be natural disasters, whether it be a threat from some people, we have been able to define and we've been able to equip ourselves with these defensive mechanisms. Now, when it comes to that, of course, what are the things that you defend yourself from? You defend yourself, you defend your mal, your wealth, your jan, your life, your abru, meaning your honor and respect. You defend your boundaries, you defend your country, country you defend your tribe, you defend, on top of all of that, your faith as well. These are things that people like to defend. Now, out of all of these things that I mentioned, of course, life is something, there's no compromise. You're allowed to, at times, do things which may not be permissible on normal circumstances in order to go ahead and prevent your life. We've mentioned that in the earlier days, and I'm sure there's no need to remind that if you're dying of hunger, you don't have to wait for halal food to arrive. If you're dying of thirst, you don't have to wait for that drink which is permissible for you to drink. Anything that saves your life. All the means and measures, this is where exception occurs. The same thing when it comes to defending your family. When it comes to defending your country, you don't need a madhab or religion to come and tell you that. If you need to defend your house, you don't need guidelines how are you going to defend your house. You have all the right in the world to defend from any force that is barging into your door, and you can take whatever measures that you can. Similarly, if on this priority list is faith, and which should be there, then it is our duty collectively to defend our faith as well from a variety of things that pose threat to our faith. And why are we going to defend our faith? Because if you're not able to defend it, then you're not able to pass it down to the next generation either. If you're unable to perform a duty, and these, all of these things are linked together, if you look at step number one was learning and recognition. Step two was Complete submission. You can only show submission if you've learned it. Third step was spreading. You can only spread when you've learned it and when you completely believe in it yourself. If I don't completely believe in it myself, am I going to go ahead and preach it? I can sit over here and tell you all I want to that how bad it is to do ghibat. But if I myself am caught doing ghibat, then it will not have any effect on you. Remember the story of a man who brought his son to Rasulullah 
to tell his son that eating honey for him is harmful. At that time, he must have had developed some, you know, effects of dessert that eating honey was not, you know, good for him. Normal circumstances, honey is good. It has cure for many illnesses. Rasulullah said to this man, bring your son back tomorrow. He brings him back the next day. Rasulullah says to the son, oh, my son, listen to your father. Don't eat honey for until however it is for you bad. The man said to Rasulullah, oh, Rasulullah, I don't mind doing your ziyarat every day. But you could have said the same thing yesterday. We wouldn't have to make this trip again today. Rasulullah said, yesterday when you asked me this question, I myself had consumed some honey. And if I had tried to convince this child, it is possible that may not have the similar effect. And therefore, I asked you to come back and make another trip. So therefore, defending our faith becomes that much, diff- that much vital for us, for our survival. And it is indeed the duty that we all collectively share. So when we are defending, tonight you're going to be listening to the Masaib of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas. You just heard the Marsiya and Salam and souls of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas. Inshallah, towards the Masaib, I'll recite these couplets, but I'll share these couplets right now. When Hazrat Abbas had come under attack, when he was bringing the water back, in Arabic, for defense, there's a word called hamiya, ha mim ya. And from the same root, you have the word muhami, the lawyers who defend people. Hazrat Abbas, when his right hand was struck, as he was trying to guard this water skin, he read these couplets. He said, Wallahi, in qata'atum yamini. By God, if you cut off my right hand, or as you have cut off my right hand, inni urhami abadan andini, I'll continue to defend my deen, even after having lost my right arm. Meaning what? What was he doing? Is he not allowed to go ahead and save himself? But defending this deen was the top priority for Abul Fadl al-Abbas whose Masaib you will hear tonight. Imam Hussain summarized it. Very beautifully, many of these sayings of Sayyid al-Shuhada in Karbala, they themselves are entire majalis. Words of wisdom spoken so eloquently at occasions when it was most needed. Imam, in one of those sayings, he says, People are servants of this world. Religion and faith is merely utterance of their tongues. It's hanging off their tongues. They'll be hanging around as long as this deen is fulfilling their hajat and their financial needs. Ma'aish is your you know, earnings. They'll hang around this deen as long as ma'ishat is good, economy is good. But is a muhisu bil bala. But the moment they face a calamity, you'll see very few are mutadayyin. Very few are faithful. Very few are religious. And an observation. When everything is going at ease, alhamdulillah, wealth is coming in, and children are growing, And we're living a very happy life. We'll hang around this deen. We'll come to Masajid, Imam Bargas. We'll go for ziyarat. We'll do all these things. 
But the moment difficulty comes in our life, فَقَدَرَ عَلَيْهِ رِزْقَهُ As the ayat of Quran says, the moment Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tightens our sustenance, then for some, their religiosity might increase, meaning they'll start praying more. Now they're in musibah, they'll go ahead and start praying more and more. They'll be seen, seen on musalla all the time. Now how come you weren't on musalla when everything was going at ease? Or the opposite effect, you won't see them around anymore. When they're financially struggling, when some other thing is bothering them, then you see qallad dayyanun, according to Imam. People are servants of the world. Let me repeat. People are servants of the world, and deen is hanging off their tongues. As long as their financial means are met, they're going to be seen around. But the moment things are tightened up for them, you see very few remain religious. That is the reason the very famous ayat of Quran, it says, الَّذِينَ يُنْفِقُونَ فِي السَّرَّائِ وَالدَّرَّائِ وَالْكَاذِمِينَ الْغَيْثِ وَالْعَافِينَ عَنِ النَّاسِ وَاللَّهُ يُحِبُّ الْمُسِنِينَ Those who spend whether at ease or adversity. He needs you all the time. Well, I'm very short on cash nowadays. You know, it's very difficult to put food on table. Or when it comes to asking for religious dues, how am I going to defend homes if I don't pay homes? On the Day of Judgment, someone was narrating a story, a farziya, hypothesis. He said, when we arrive and we stand in front of Imam, because Imam has promised shafaat, right? Those who come to Majlis Aza, those who come to this farsha Aza, one of the benefits of this farsha Aza is what? Shafaat of Ahlul Bayt. This is proven through a hadith. When Imam Hussain's shahadat was mentioned by Rasulullah to his daughter, Janab Sayyida. Rasulullah said to Janab Sayyida that this son of yours will be martyred in Karbala. Janab Sayyida asked a question Will I be there at that time? Rasulullah said, No, you won't be there. Will you be there? Rasulullah said, I won't be there either. Will Ali be there? He said, No, Ali won't be there. Will Hassan be there? He said, No, Hassan won't be there. Janab Sayyida cried. Then who is going to be there to, you know, defend and to stand with Hussein? And after his shahadat, and then Rasulullah said that famous hadith, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will create a nation. Not that it will bring into existence that didn't exist before. No, these people existed. But they will carry the torch. And yujaddidun al aza. Jilan bada jilin, the words of Rawayat. That they will continue this aza generations after generations. After hearing this, Janab Sayyidah made a dua that by God I will be there on the day of Mahshar to do shafa of these people. I'll be present to intercede on their behalf. Intercession is guaranteed. When you come here. So someone was mentioning. Imagine we arrive at that scene. But for you to have the intercession of Masumin. You need to bring something with you. Can you go empty handed? Pockets are empty. And you're asking for intercession. No bring something from you. Imam says. Whatever you're lacking. We will add on to it. From our actions. Your actions as is. If completely performed, are defective. Can any one of us say that my salat, all of my prayers are accepted? Imam Khomeini said, all of my entire life, I can't say if any of my prayers were accepted. This is someone who's faqih. This is someone who's arif. This is someone who's alim. Is someone who caused 
an inqilab. Not an ordinary person. He said, I can't tell with guarantee that if any of my prayers, and many of those prayers were led by him, either in Najaf or in Qum. He said, except the two rakat salat. And he writes in his autobiography, he writes, what is that two rakat salat? He said, the day when I was arrested by the people of Shah. They arrested me from Qom and they were taking me to Tehran. The old route between Qom and Tehran, I'm sure all of you, many of you have done ziyarat. Now there's a new route between Qom and Tehran. It's a nice highway. They call it Autobahn over there. But there was old Jadde Qadim, the old route. It was not as good as this one. He said he was taking me. These guards sitting on right and left. I'm in the middle. Even at that time, Imam Hwain, he was already in his 70s. And it was time of Salatul Fajr. I said to these guards, can you stop here by the side of this highway so I can offer two rakas salat? He said, no, we don't have permission. Strict orders, we need to bring you to Tehran. He said, yeah, but you know the time of Fajr is limited. By the time we get there, it'll be qaza. And I don't have the habit of making my salat qaza. And plus, look, I'm an old man. You think I'm going to run away in this middle of this desert? Look at me. You're younger than me. I'm a 70-year-old man. I don't have the legs to run you out. So can you please stop and... Let me pray. I'm willing to comply with everything. They said he, listened. he said they listened. They stopped the car for a few minutes, and I offered my salat. He said, aside from this salat, which, for which I had to fight for, I don't think any of my salat were accepted. Or I don't know, I can't tell for sure if any of my salat were accepted. If someone like him says his salat is not, of course, he's saying it out of, Immense humbleness, but imagine our salat. And therefore, when you stand up in front of Imam, at least you've brought something. Something that you can show Imam, this is what I've done. The rest is upon you. I'll give you another example. I come here from New Jersey, and this community has a lot of relations with New Jersey. It's a Molana. There's a proposal for our daughter. A boy is from New Jersey. The boy's family is from New Jersey. Do you know so-and-so? If I know so-and-so, of course, I need to tell you about them. Or, because I have relationship with someone who's known, he said, Maulana, can you use your connections and get my son this job? Because you know the CEO of the company. And so what's the merit? How much? What, what has he done? Well, he's not really that well educated. But because of our relationship, can you put in a good word for him? Even I would have difficult time because it's against justice to go ahead and recommend someone who doesn't belong at that place. When I won't do that, you think Imam is going to go ahead and do this sort of shafaat? That is the reason sixth Imam, Imam Jafar al-Sadiq alayhi salatu wa salam. You heard his wasiyat, right? One of the wasaya of sixth Imam was what? La yanalo shafa'atana man istakhaffa bis salat. That person will not receive our intercession, the one who takes salat lightly. He didn't say the one who doesn't pray. Because the one who doesn't pray, there's an ayat in the Quran for those people. Go read Surah Muddathir. What does the ayat of Surah Muddathir says? Ma salakakum fi saqar. There's a mukalima, conversation between the inhabitants of Jannat and the inhabitants of Jahannam. The people of Jannat will ask the people of Jahannam, Ma salakakum fi saqar. Saqar is another name for Jahannam. What landed you in Saqar? What brought you to Jahannam? Ma salakakum fi Saqar. The first reply these people will give is, Lam nakum al-musallin. 
we were not amongst those people who used to pray. So the ayat of Quran is straightforward in this regard. Here, the one who takes salat lightly, you think Imam is going to go ahead and do intercession for that individual? Inshallah. We show up. Imam said, amongst the salat, what do you got? He said, well, you know, I didn't pray much or any at all for that matter. Where's, your, where's the fast? You know, I was always sick. I had diabetes and all that stuff from the very beginning. Didn't really do any fasting either. What about Hajj? He said, well, very hand to mouth all my life. Never really got the opportunity and istatat to go to Hajj. Khoms. Imam, what did you say? Khoms. This is the first time I'm hearing this word. Khoms is our haq that you're supposed to give while you were alive in this world. The way that individual took away and usurped the right of Janab Sayyida, if someone does not give homes today, is also usurping the right of Imam Zamana. So be mindful of that. If I don't give it, how am I going to defend it? These are all part of the bigger occasion or bigger picture. So therefore, Imam al Sam said, whenever the mushkil comes upon, very few are going to be showing their religiosity. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Don't think the enemy is going to give up. They're relentless. Shaitan keeps coming after you. He doesn't give up. And Shaitan doesn't sit outside of clubs and pubs and bars. Shaitan sits right outside of your Imam Barga, right outside of your masjid. Not just yours, every masjid, every Imam Barga. That's where he's sitting. Because when you come inside, you don taqwa, piety, and the libas of taqwa and piety. And you gain this marifat, not through my speeches, but being in the environment and the ambience that is created, the black all around, alam will be brought out, you'll be shedding tears, you'll be, as you burn calories by controlling your diet, you're going to be burning sins tonight by shedding tears. When alam comes out, and you're weeping and you're crying and you're kissing it, guess what? You're burning these sins away. All good the moment you walk out. That's where the challenge is. That's where you need to keep that shield in place. Majalis are providing that shield for you. Hence the importance of this aza. Don't undermine this aza. Don't say, I'll watch it from, the, from YouTube. Today we have this comfort. We went through COVID. It's no longer there. Come out of the houses. A lot of times children, you bring them, you say, well, you want me to watch the majlis, right? I'll watch it from my computer. It's not just watching and listening from the computer or from the TV. Yeah, it's a good tool to have when there's no opportunity. You know, there's so many centers that I've visited, or so many communities, rather, I've visited. They don't have a center like this. Well, you know what they rely upon? YouTube. They all sit in a house. If a scholar visits them, good. If the scholar cannot go, which is the case majority of the time, they have a TV and they're playing a live feed from your center or from my center. That's how they do their aza. So be very, very thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you have this place where you're able to commemorate and celebrate all of the occasions associated with deen mubin islam and we're able to pay tribute to masumin sallu ala muhammad wa ali muhammad how do we defend even one word there's a person by the name ammar duhni lived in the time of sixth imam there was a qadi, a judge by the name Abu Layla at that time. Amar Duhuni was brought in as a witness. 
he bore witness to some crime or some you know, case that was being heard. The Qadi judge refused his witness. This is the time of 60 Imam. And you know what he said? The reason I'm refusing your witness, because of two reasons. Number one, you are Shia. Number two, you are Rafidi. I'm sure kids have heard the term Rafidi, but many may not know what it means. Ammar Dohni shed some tears. He started crying. Abu Layla felt sorry for him. He said, maybe you're having a change of heart. He said, no, no, I'm not crying for myself. I'm crying that who made you Qadi? I'm crying that who put you in the seat of being a judge? He said, what do you mean? He said, you associated two things. This is a litmus test, brothers and sisters. You associated two things with me, which I personally see that are not in me. You called me Shia, and you called me Rafidi. You know who were Rafidi? The first time the term Rafidi was associated, was associated with those magicians who after seeing the Mu'jiza and the miracle of Hazrat Musa wasalam, they fell in sajda. And they say we bring Iman to the Rabb of Harun and Musa. To which Fir'aun has said, how dare you follow another god besides me? I'll have you all killed. They were called Rafidi. Why? Because they did Rafada. Rafada means inkar, denial. They denied shait- Fir'aun, shaitan. They denied Fir'aun. And they accepted Hazrat Musa. He said, where is the maqam of those Rafidi and where am I? Number two, you call me Shia. He said, how can you call me Shia? When Shia are Salman, Abu Dhar, Miqdad, and Ammar. They are the Shia of Ali. I'm nowhere close to being the dust of these individuals. He left. He defended. He said this, and then he left. He came to sixth Imam. He said, Imam, I had this encounter with Qadi Abu Layla. Imam said, you defended our madhab. You defended imamat. Guaranteed for you is jannat. This is how you defend. This is how you stand up. And there are many such stories. Have you heard of the name Hassan ibn Yusuf ibn Mutahar? But when I'll tell you his kunniyat, his title, you'll know. Allameh Hilli. His name is? Hassan ibn Yusuf ibn Mutahar. What did Allama Hilli do? I know I'm running out of my time and I haven't gone to the... Allama Hilli is someone, I'll put away the notes so that some relief for you guys. Allama Hilli is someone who is mujahid of his time. There were these institutions that were called mobile institutions in Iran at that time. There was a sultan who was the ruler in Iran by the name Sultan Khudabande. Allah Mahilli, when he went from Iraq, when he went from Najaf, when he went to Sallu Allah Muhammad Wa Alim When will Allah Salwa When he arrived in Iran, he met with, well, he didn't right away meet with Sultan Khudabande because Sultan Khudabande was not a Shia. Sultan Khudabande was someone who one day got angry at his wife and he said, I divorce you, I divorce you, I divorce you. Talaq, 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 three times. And you know, in Sunni Madhab, if you divorce, and you say three times, talaq, talaq, talaq. Your wife becomes ba'in, meaning that you can't remarry. Because third talaq, 
puts on that ban that you can no longer marry the same individual again after certain things have to be done. Quran also says, At-talaq maratain. Talaq is twice. After the third talaq, either you retain or you let go in peace and in, with amicably. But of course, there's a difference, difference in our shariat and their shariat. And of course, right after this, he felt sorry. He said, I didn't mean to say this. He referred to all of the Sunni scholars, the four schools of Sunni, Madhab, the Hanafi, the Maliki, the Shafi'i, the Hanbalis. All of the scholars of these Madhab said, nothing can be done, Sultan. Your wife is permanently haram for you. And the only means is what Quran mentions, halala, that she must marry someone else, that man should divorce her, and then only you can retain her, then marry her again. But of course, this is not an ordinary woman. This is the queen. And will the king allow the queen to marry someone else like this? Even if was shariat was involved in it? So he was stuck. His vizier told him that I know someone who doesn't follow any of these fiqh. But he's an alim. Let's refer to him. So they bring in Allah Mahilli. Allah Mahilli asks him, when you gave this talaq, was it in normal condition or were you angry? He said, I was extremely furious and angry. He said, well, this talaq doesn't count. Number two, were there two witnesses present? He said, no, there was nobody there. It was just me and my wife. And so the Quran says, Dawa adlin. There should be two adil witnesses when the seal of talaq is recited. He said, no, there was nobody that was there. We fought and I said talaq, talaq, talaq three times. Allah Ma'ali said, according to our fiqh, this talaq hasn't taken place. You're still husband and wife. And of course, Sultan, Sultan Khudabande was excited. But he said, I need to be able to tell the world about it. Right now, they all think that my wife is divorced. And we need to make sure that everybody knows, according to this fiqh, she is not. So he established this gathering in the center of the city, mosque, invited scholars from all different faiths, especially the four madahib of Islam. And uh, he also invited Allah Mahilli. But when gathering was set, Allah Mahilli walked in, as you guys have the shoe racks outside. Instead of putting his shoes in there, he put his shoes under his armpit and he walked in and sat next to the sultan. So there was a chair next to the sultan. Now this man is walking in with his shoes under his arm and he comes and sits next to the sultan. Right away, people started laughing. Look at this is the Rafidi scholar. This is the Shia scholar. Look at him. Has no etiquettes. That when you're coming to a gathering, that too in front of the king, you don't walk in with your shoes. He came and he sat down. Obvious question. The elephant in the room, he wanted to address that. He said, you might be wondering why I have my shoes with me, right? I heard that there are people of the followers of the first Imam Abu Hanifa. And I've heard that he stole Prophet's shoes. So I'm afraid they'll steal my shoes as well. People scolded him, saying, have you gone out of your mind? Imam Abu Hanifa was born in the 80th year after Hijrah. 70 years after the wafat of Rasulullah. He didn't even see Rasulullah. How can he steal his shoes? Well, then it has to be Imam Malik. Because I heard there are people of Imam Malik's mak maktab is over here as well. You see, Imam Malik came 20 years down the road after Imam Abu Hanifa. So then it has to be Imam Shafi'i. He said, you've lost it completely. Imam Shafi'i came 150 years after Rasulullah. So then I'm sure it has to be Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal who stole Prophet's shoes. He said, There's, you're going to go to all extent, right? Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal came 200 years after Rasulullah. 
once all was said and done, he said, you mean to tell me that this whole entire hall, all the people in this hukumat, all the people in this town, all the people in this country are following the fiqh of four individuals. None of them had seen Rasulullah. The first one came 70 years later. Second one came 100 years later. Third one came 150 years later. Fourth one came 200 years later. Everyone, well, is not looking at him. He said, well, who do you follow? Whose fiqh do you follow? He said, we follow the fiqh of the one who is referred to in Quran as the nafs rasul We received our fiqh and our maktab and our madhab from someone for which Quran says, anfusuna wa anfusukum thumma naptahil fa naja'alla natallahi alal kathibin. Salawat bhaji Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. So he established. Ayatullah Wahid, I heard him recite this once, and he concluded it like this. He said, Allama Hilli walked into a majlis where everyone was the follower of the four madahib of Ahl Sunnat. And when he walked out of that majlis, everyone was the follower of Maktab Ahl Tashayyu. He said, when he walked into the majlis, People had offered their previous prayers according to the madhab of Ahl Tasannun. But when he walked out, everybody offered their salat according to the madhab of Ahl Tashayyo. He said, that's called defending your deen. He didn't have a magical wand in his hand. But he was able to do it based on the ilm that he possessed. I want to give more time to Masaib as these nights that we get into are the nights of Giriya and Zari. We are here because someone who's Masaib that you'll hear tonight said, Wallahi in qata'atum yamini, inni uhami abadan andini. By God, if you cut off my arms, I'll still continue to defend this thing. Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas was born in the year 26th after Hijrah. Son of Amir al-Mu'mineen, who after the shahadat of Janab al-Sayyida, asked his brother, Aqil, who was an expert in genealogy, Ansab, Ilmi Ansab, that show me or find me a family which is known for its bravery, valor. He said, why? So I want to marry a woman from that family, so that Allah bestows me brave children from her. Now you know the role of a mother in the genes of a child. If they're going to be timid, if they're going to be brave, these khasal and these traits, according to Imam Ali, come from the mothers. That's the ta'thir and the effects of our mothers. Hazrat Aqil finds Fatima bint Hizam from Kilabiya as the wife of Amir al-Mu'mineen. Imam marries her. She gives birth to four children, four kids. All four were martyred in Karbala. One of them is Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas who was born in the year 26 after Hijrah. He was 14 years old at the time of the Shahadat of Amir al-Mu'mineen. And in this young age, he had already shown heroics in some of the battles that Imam fought, Safin and Jamal. And then he spent 10 years under the tutelage of Imam Hassan. And then after the Shahadat of Imam Hassan, the next 10 years, with his brother, Imam Hussein. A great deal of respect that he had for Imam Hussein. And that is the reason he always called him Mola. Maybe because this was the wasiyat of Amir al-Mu'mineen. When Imam was struck by the sword of Ibn Muljam, he gave everyone's hands in the hands of Imam Hassan, but then called upon Abbas and Hussein 
and then gave Abbas's hand into the hand of Imam Hussein, or vice versa. And he said, oh, Abbas, know that Hussein is the son of Rasulullah, and you are my son. And as long as you're alive, make sure that nothing happens to Hussein. <coughs> Abbas knows his work is cut off, that this is the reason for his creation, and this is the reason for his existence. That he's there to do himayat, defend from Imam Hussein. Spent the entire life serving Sayyid al-Shuhada, especially in the ayam leading up to Karbala. You know the wujud and the presence of Hazrat Abbas, what it brought? The women in the desert, in the jungles, throughout the way, slept peacefully and comfortably. Because the sheer of Ali ibn Abi Talib was out there guarding. As long as the line of Ali was out there, they had no fear whatsoever. That's why when Amir al-Mu'mineen kissed the arms of Bibi Zainab upon his shahadat, before his shahadat, saying, O oh Zainab, there will come a day when there will be chains and ropes around your neck and your arms. Zainab smiled and said, Oh Baba, how dare can someone put chains and ropes around my hands and my arms with a brother like Abu al-Fadl Abbas? But when the tents were burning, Janab Zainab said, Laqad saddaqa Amir al-Mu'mineen. Amir al-Mu'mineen said it correctly. I see the day which is upon us that we'll be all in chains and shackles. Ajrukum Allah. You don't need Masaib to really cry. You can just take yourself, as you heard in the Marsi as well, take yourself to Karbala tonight. Imagine that you're there present and you feel it and let the tears come down on its own. Hazrat Abbas is someone who is the standard bearer of Imam Hussein. Imam from the very first day gave the flag to Abbas. That was in a way Imam telling him that you're not going to the battlefield of Abbas. Abbas, you're not going to the battlefield. As the Abbas saw one after another, the companions get killed and attain shahadat. Then began the kids and the children and the young men of Banu Hashim, one after another. They would go to the battlefield, and they would come back. Quickly, let me summarize for the kids who are listening and don't speak well Urdu, before I switch over to Urdu. That Abbas protected Hussein until the last breath. And then he couldn't see it. He wanted to go to the battlefield. He wanted to show what he was made of. He wanted to display his bravery for which Imam, Hussain, Imam Ali had married Fatima bint Hizam. But Imam Hussain did not give him permission to go into the battlefield formally. Rather, Imam gave him a task to go ahead and get the water for the children because the Al-Atash Al -Atash is striking in the ears. And upon bringing it back, the Shahadat of Abu al-Fadl Abbas takes place. یہ وہ عباس ہے کہ جب امام حسین کے تمام اصحاب نے شہادت کا نظرانہ پیش کر دیا ایک ایک کر کے جب جوانہ نے بنو حاشم شب شہید کر دیے گئے تو اب عباس نے اجازت طلب کی امام حسین نے کہا عباس تم تو اس سپاہ کے سالار ہو تم تو قائد ہو تم تو سٹینڈرڈ بیئر ہو تم کو کیسے میں جانے کی اجازت دے دوں ایک دفعہ عباس نے مڑ کے دیکھا اور کہا مولا وہ سپا کہاں ہے جس کا میں سردار ہوں وہ آرمی کہاں ہے جس کا میں سالار ہوں 
وہ سب کے سب شہید کیے جا چکے ہیں اب امام کے پاس کوئی بہانہ نہیں ہے عباس کو کس طریقے سے روکیں بس ایک دفعہ امام کہتے ہیں عباس تمہیں آواز آ رہی ہے خیمے سے کہا مولا اسی آواز کی وجہ سے میں مقتل جانا چاہتا ہوں کب تک ان بچوں کی آواز کان میں پڑے گی مجھ سے رہا نہیں جاتا ہے یہ بے بسی دیکھی نہیں جاتی ہے اے عباس اگر کچھ کرنا چاہتے ہو تو جاؤ بچوں کے لیے پانی کا بندوبست کر دو پھر بعد میں جہاد کرتے رہنا عباس آتے ہیں جناب سکینہ سے وہ مشکیزہ لیتے ہیں سکینہ نے چچا کو مشکیزہ دیا بچے سب ایک ساتھ کھڑے ہو گئے ہاتھ میں چھوٹے چھوٹے کوزے لے کے ارے میرے میرے چچا وعدہ کرتے ہیں تو وعدے کو وفا کرتے ہیں بس آپ کی آوازیں بلند ہوئی اجرکم اللہ خدا کسی غم میں نہ رلائے سوائے غم آل محمد کے عباس نے ہاتھ میں علم لیا ایک ہاتھ سے مشکیزہ لیا اپنے راہوار کو سدھارا چلتے ہیں اور چلتے ہیں فراد کی جانب لیکن ابن عمر سعد نے فراد پہ چار ہزار تائنات کر دیے ہیں سپاہی کہ عباس کو آنے سے روکا جا سکے یہ شیر یہ دلیر یہ شجا حیدری دکھاتا ہوا سیدھی طرف کی جتنے بھی سپاہتے ان کو دھکیلا جو دائے طرف تھے ان کو دھکیلا عباس اب تنہا ہے فراد کے اوپر قبضہ کر کے دکھانا چاہتے ہیں دشمن کو ہاتھ میں پانی اٹھا کے کہ عباس کے دکستہ قبضے میں پانی ہے اگر چاہوں تو پی لو اجرکبل اللہ عباس پی لیتے پانی تو کبھی دنیا والے عباس کو برا نہ کہتے لیکن عباس کیسے پیچے ابھی تک حسین پیاسے ہیں ابھی تک سکینہ پیاسی ہے اور ابھی تک جت چھوٹے چھوٹے بچے پیاسے ہیں عباس نے اپنے راوار کو چھوڑ دیا گھوڑے سے کہا تو پانی پی لے یہ دیکھئے با وفا عباس کا با وفا گھوڑا ہے پانی کی طرف دیکھا تو صحیح مگر پانی نہ پیا شاید بے زبان نے یہ کہا ہو کہ ابھی حسین کا راہوار پیاسا ہے میں کیسے سہراب ہو جاؤں اجرکم اللہ عباس نے مشکیزے میں پانی بھرا اب اپنے گھوڑے پہ سوار ہوتے ہیں زندگی کا بس اب آئے گا آخری مقصد ہے کسی طرح پانی خیمگاہ تک پہنچ جائے عباس چلے ہیں خیمے کی طرف ہاتھ میں علم ہے دوسرے ہاتھ ہاتھ میں مشکیزہ ہے دشمن نے چاروں جانب سے تیر بارانی شروع کی ارے کوئی دس بارہ تیر نہ تھے ہزاروں کی تعداد میں تیر زہرہ کا لال فاطمہ کا لال علی کا دلیر عباس جانا چاہتا ہے ہزاروں کی تعداد میں تیر پھیکے جا رہے ہیں ایک دفعہ وہ وقت آتا ہے دشمن زید ابن ورقہ ایک جگہ چھپتا ہے عباس نزدیک سے گزرے دائیں ہاتھ پہ حملہ دائیں ہاتھ پہ حملہ کرنا تھا عباس کا دائیں بازو کٹ کے گر گیا عباس نے علم کو سمالا مشکیزے کو سمالا بس اب ایک تیارہ فی رخ ہے خیمہ گاہ تک پہنچایا جا سکے دوسری طرف سے نوفل ابن ارزرق نے چھپ کے عباس کے بائیں ہاتھ پہ حملہ کیا ارے بائیں ہاتھ بھی قطع ہو گیا جو لوگ زیارت پہ گئے ہیں اگر آپ دیکھیں ادھر امام حسین کا زوزہ ہے اس کے پیچھے خیام ہے اس کے آپوزر سائٹ پہ نہر فرات ہے عباس جس طریقے سے آئے گھومتے ہوئے آئے تھے پہلے کتف آئے من ہوا پھر کتف آئے سر گرا اب عباس کے پاس بازو نہیں ہے اپنے جسم سے اس مشکیزے کو ڈھکا ہوا ہے لیکن ایک ایسا تیر آتا ہے جو آکے پیوست ہوتا ہے مشک میں 
मश्क में पेवस्त होना था सारा का सारा पानी बह गया इधर पानी का बहना था अब्बास अब्बास की आस टूट गई अरे अब मैं क्या करूंगा खैम का जाके अपने रावार को रोका पुष्ट की तरफ रुख किया कि दोबारा जंग करे अब्बास लेकिन जंग कैसे करे अब हाथ भी मौजूद नहीं एक दफा एक दफा हकीम इतने तो फैल ने एक ऐसा वार किया अब्बास के माथे पे कि अब्बास डग मगाए आवाजें बुलंद हुई अब्बास तक मगाए जमी पे आए अभी जमी पे आना था का असलाम आने का या बाप दिल्ला अलह का मिन्नी सलाम अब्बास ने असलाम वाले का नहीं कहा का अलह का मिन्नी सलाम ए हुसैन आखिरी सलाम अब्बास का हुसैन ने यह सुनना था दौड़ते हुए आगे बढ़े अब्बास के करीब पहुंचे अपनी कमर पे हाथ रखा और कहा अलान इनका सारा जहरी व कल्लत ही लती अरे मेरी कमर टूट गई सारी तदबीरें खत्म हो गई अब्बास बस आखिरी दो जुमले और आपकी जहमत तमाम एक दफा हुसैन ने अब्बास के सर को गोद में रखा चेहरे से खून को पोछा अरे गुफ्तु की अब्बास से गुफ्तु की अब्बास को ले जाना चाहते हैं खैमे का कहा मौला मुझे खैमा ना लेके जाइएगा मैं किस तरीके से सकीना से रूबर हूंगा इमाम हुसैन ने वही छोड़ा एक दफा अब्बास के चेहरे पे गिरिए के आसार हैं मौला ने कहा है अब्बास अब गिरिए की क्या जरूरत अरे कुछ ही देर में साखी कौसर तुम्हें सैराब करेंगे कहा मौला इस बात का गिरिया है जब मैं जमी पे आया तो आप पहुंचे मेरे सर को जानू पे रखा अभी थोड़ी देर में आप जमी पे आएंगे तो कौन होगा जो आपके किनारे पहुंचे इमाम हुसैन ने अलम हाथ में लिया खैमे का रुख किया बच्चों ने दूर से अलम आता देखा समझे अब्बास आ रहे हैं करीब पहुंचे देखा हुसैन है सकीना ने पूछा ए बाबा मेरे चचा कहा है कहा है सकीना तुम्हारे चचा दरिया किनारे सो गए मातमे हुसैन 